Captain America is one of the most iconic characters in all of popular fiction and the longtime flag bearer for Marvel Comics ever since his creation in 1941. Steve Rogers has, for almost 80 years, stood as the longest serving hero in the modern Marvel Universe, carrying the company through the golden age of comics before returning to help usher in Marvel's resurgence in the 1960s to his modern adventures and popular adaptations within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Which makes it all the more strange that at one point in the character's history, Steve Rogers almost found himself on a new battlefield, fighting strange new foes in the form of the DC Universe. Now, I'm aware how crazy and far-fetched this sounds, but during Marvel's darkest moments, the possibility of Cap and other popular Marvel heroes being sold away to their biggest competitors was actually real. And in this video, we're going to discuss the factors that led up to this deal ever being put on the table, and how its refusal by Marvel's boss Martin Goodman may have saved the company altogether. So, let's start this video off with a quick overview of the creation of Captain America, and the character's history up until the mid-1950s. Captain America was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby in March of 1941, for then Timely Comics, the predecessor to Marvel, first appearing in Captain America Comics issue 1, and debuting in one of the most possibly recognisable and shocking ways ever. Inspired by the dual success of DC's Superman in 1939 and Batman in 1940, Simon and Kirby sought to create their own iconic superhero who embodied the values and ideals of contemporary America. Cap leapt onto the pages of comics a year before the events of Pearl Harbor, but at a time where the Second World War had already begun across Europe. As Jack Kirby himself stated, Captain America was created for a time that needed noble figures. We weren't at war yet, but everyone knew it was coming. That's why Captain America was born. America needed a super patriot. Captain America quite literally wore his political beliefs on his sleeve, and though it's hard to imagine considering how popular the character is today, this rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. So much so that after the first issue was released, which did sell almost a million copies, Simon and Kirby received a huge amount of backlash and threatening letters sent to Marvel's offices, with isolationist groups such as the American First Committee and the German American Bund actually physically protesting outside the company's headquarters, a situation that got so bad that the New York police actually had to intervene to protect the young writers. Nevertheless, Steve Rogers rose to become one of the most popular characters of the decade, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman from DC Comics, as well as Fawcett Comics' incredibly popular Captain Marvel character. And throughout the war years, Steve Rogers served as a symbol of resilience and hope for both those fighting on the front line and also those back home in the States. Captain America truly embodied the patriotic nature of superhero comics during the war period, and it felt like this golden age for the medium was never going to end. Our heroes would always be there to save the day, and we'd always need them. So what happened to the superheroes when the people no longer felt that they needed saving? While the 1940s proved to be one of the most successful time periods in terms of comic book sales and popularity for the genre, the 1950s proved to be a far less kind era for the industry. In the aftermath of the Second World War, it seems as if the public no longer needed glorious and patriotic heroes to inspire them. Superheroes quickly became old news in favour of new genres of comics, including pulp, horror, romance and western. Now this shift in popularity majorly affected both Marvel and DC, the two biggest players in the market, who both had to cancel a number of formerly popular characters and titles as a result of continuously declining sales. For DC, characters like Green Lantern, The Flash, and even the Justice Society of America were scrapped, while Marvel reluctantly had to stop publishing the likes of Namor the Submariner and The Human Torch. Marvel, being a far smaller company than DC at this time, felt this blow much heavier. While DC continued to publish the likes of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, Marvel desperately tried to keep their powerhouse hero, Captain America, in publication, resulting in the company attempting to retrofit the Star-Spangled Avenger into these newly popular genres, K-1, 
Case in point, in late 1949, Marvel actually renamed his series to Captain America's Weird Tales, though this ultimately failed to gain any additional buzz, with Marvel forced to cancel the title altogether in February 1950, placing the Captain America character on ice. However, this wasn't the only problem that plagued Marvel at this time. You see, it was one thing to actually get a changing taste of readership to pick up Marvel's books, but the company was actually struggling to get them onto shelves entirely. This problem arose a few years earlier, in 1951, when Marvel's owner Martin Goodman became fed up with the costs and limitations of working with a distributor to release and promote their books. So instead, Goodman decided to create his own distributor in the form of Atlas News Company, believing that by controlling their own distribution, this could allow Marvel to pump out an increased number of books, flooding the market with their own titles, and essentially drowning out the competitors. However, this costly business venture mixed with Marvel's declining sales over the subsequent years, saw Goodman lose money fast, ultimately forced to close Atlas News down in 1956. Desperately in need of a new distributor for his company's books, Goodman was forced to sign a five-year deal with another distribution company, the American News Company, later that same year. Unfortunately, in May of 1957, the American News Company folded, leaving Goodman and Marvel with no way of getting their books out and onto the shelves, effectively leaving Marvel stranded in the ocean, left to wither away and die. Things were especially bleak for Marvel at this time. By the mid-1950s, not only did the company struggle to find a distributor for their books, but they also had to deal with the re-emergence of DC Comics superheroes into the market and the birth of the Silver Age of comic books. As of October 1956 with Showcase Issue 4, DC began to reintroduce and reimagine many of the classic characters that they were forced to cancel years earlier, beginning with Barry Allen, the new Flash, and soon after bringing back the likes of Green Lantern, Hawkman and Aquaman, laying the groundwork for the formation of the Justice League of America in 1960, and a hugely successful period for DC. Contrast this to Marvel's attempts to bring their superheroes back a few years earlier. You see, by late 1953, Marvel had been superhero free for almost three years, with the company shifting its focus instead to publishing comics that mirrored popular trends in film and TV. As comic book historian Les Daniels noted, the short-term results were lucrative, but while other publishers took the long view and kept their stables of heroes solid, Goodman let his slide. However, with the formation of the Comics Code Authority in 1954, a censorship body aimed to protect children and ensure that comics didn't contain suggestive or inappropriate material, essentially killed off the monster and horror genres. Therefore, Stan Lee felt that the restraints of the code could actually allow Marvel to bring back some of their more child-friendly creations. As a result, in December 1953, within the pages of Young Men, issue 24, Namor and the Human Torch actually resurfaced, with Captain America also making a comeback soon after. The trio continued to make appearances in the Young Men series alongside the Men's Adventure title, while Cap and Namor solo titles were also restarted as of April and May of 1954. This, though, proved to be a bad idea, as Cap's solo title only lasted for two issues before being cancelled again, while Namor's comic struggled on until October 1955. By this time, the superheroes also weren't appearing in Men's Adventures and Young Men either. Marvel's last-ditch attempts to bring the superheroes back had failed. Captain America and his allies just weren't wanted anymore, and were finally put away, with Stan Lee and Marvel resigned to the demise of their once popular superheroes and their own fate as a company churning out uninspired knockoffs of more popular characters from other genres and companies. And this, coinciding with DC's successful attempts to bring back their superheroes, led Marvel's greatest competitors to actually consider purchasing Marvel's now discarded heroes and making them a part of the growing DC universe. In May of 1957, not long after the sudden closure of Marvel's new distributor, American News Company, Martin Goodman found himself and his company in financial disarray, forcing him to lay off all of his comic book writing staff, with the exception of one Stan Lee. 
Lee therefore became the only actual employee in the company, leaving the light on in an empty office, watching the company he'd worked for for two decades crawl to its slow and inevitable death. And DC, noticing this, offered a lifeline to their former rivals. Reed Tucker, in his book Slugfest, describes what happens next. He writes, It wasn't long before DC, sensing that Atlas was fatally wounded, ghoulishly came sniffing around. In a deal that looked insanely low ball by today's hyperinflated superhero market, DC offered to buy Atlas's characters, Captain America, Submariner, and the Human Torch for $15,000, roughly around $126,000 in today's dollars. And possibly the most shocking thing here is that Martin Goodman actually contemplated accepting the offer. Marvel were long past making superhero comics anymore and were resigned to producing other, less intensive and quicker to produce books that while selling less per issue, were able to be churned out at a much higher quantity. So if they weren't going to use these characters, why not sell them and make some money? Especially when your company is financially struggling and unable to find a distributor. Eventually, Goodman did reject DC's offer and instead sought after finding a new distributor for the company eventually signing a deal with Independent News, who just so happened to be the sister company to DC Comics. So if they couldn't buy Marvel's characters, then at least they could control how many books Marvel were releasing a month, and of what quantity. But without this deal though, as bleak as it sounds, it's very likely that Marvel Comics wouldn't have survived past the decade, and had never reached the point where characters like Captain America, The Human Torch, and Namor were able to come back into regular publication. After the explosion of Marvel's new superheroes in the early 1960s, thanks to the success of characters such as the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, the X-Men, and the Amazing Spider-Man. But regardless, it's fascinating to think that much like DC did with Shazam some years later, Captain America was almost revived and brought back into a brave new world of superheroes, but not by Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and the Avengers, but by Superman, Batman, and the Justice League of America. If this deal had happened, what would this have meant for Marvel Comics' future over the next 50 years? And what would have become of the company's first iconic superhero if the first Avenger wasn't actually an Avenger at all? <laughs> Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on everything we discussed in the video itself. What do you think it would have been like if Captain America had been bought by DC in the late 1950s? And what would this have meant for Marvel Comics as a whole in the 1960s and beyond? And what would the entire comic book landscape look like today? I can't wait to hear your thoughts on it as always. Make sure to leave a like on the video and if you're new to the channel please consider hitting the subscribe button we make videos like this every other week that hopefully you enjoy as much as you enjoyed this one. There are some other videos on screen that you might also enjoy and I also want to give a special thanks to Matt, to Nick and to Laurent for lending their voices. They're all fantastic creators and their channels are all linked in the description so go check them out. And if you want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter just at Owen Likes Comics. But that's all for me. I will see you all next time. So until then, take care and keep reading.